The epistle reading today comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. The gospel reading today comes from John chapter 1 verses 1 to 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Most times when I uh, visit someone in the hospital, I usually try to just listen as the patient pours out their story of injury or illness. If I'm good, I only say enough to keep the story going, and when I get ready to leave, I tell them I don't really have any words that will make their situation better or ease the pain or make breathing easier. 
I just say, that's okay. Thanks for coming to see me. Thanks for listening. Thanks for showing up for me. Woody Allen said 80% of success is just showing up. I think I'd say that sometimes 80% of life is just showing up. This morning, John begins his gospel of signs and sayings by telling us about God showing up in Jesus of Nazareth. John's origin story of Jesus is unique in the Gospels. Mark's Gospel doesn't have a story about Jesus' birth. He starts right up with Jesus' baptism and his time in the wilderness. Matthew uses Mark's narrative and some other material, and he adds the story of the flight to Egypt and the wise men coming from the east and of Herod's murderous attempt to kill the baby Jesus. Luke's Gospel also uses Mark and other material, but he brings Mary into the story with her Magnificat and the angels and the shepherds showing up at Jesus' birth. Instead of a birth narrative, John's Gospel tells us of God's eternal word, the Logos, who always was from the beginning of time, present at the birth of the world, and responsible for all of creation. God's words are powerful. We identify God's word with the Bible, our holy scripture. Many people feel that when we can capture the words of God, we've experienced God, as if memorizing the word gives us special power. But John isn't talking about our Bible here. He's very much aware of the great Jewish traditions of Abraham and the patriarchs, and Moses, the great Jewish leader who was entrusted with the actual words from God, the law or Torah. Words like the Ten Words or the Decalogue, our Ten Commandments, that we revere even when we don't always follow them. He isn't speaking about just words here. <clears throat> Listen to the parallel between these two passages. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Long before John put ink to paper, the Logos, the Word, was seen as God's creative force. An educated person in John's time knew that Logos doesn't mean just Word in a literal sense. It's more like the rational principle of the universe, the underlying pattern of the cosmic fabric, the warp and weft by which all things hang together. The Logos is not just God's creative power or agency, it's the origin of human reasoning, the glue that holds all things together, and sometimes wisdom itself. It's why things make sense, the reason cause follows effect, why there is something rather than nothing. Because the Logos is, everything else is too. The psalm writer remembers that. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all their host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea as in a bottle. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. And the prophet Isaiah promises a voice, says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. And John places that logos, the word, directly in our path. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory. The glory is of a father's son, 
full of grace and truth. Emmanuel, God with us. God shows up in Jesus. God wants to be with us, to have a relationship with us, but God is a spirit. No one has ever seen God or can. In the book of Exodus, Moses tried to see God's face, and God refused because it would have killed him. So he only got to see where God had been. But from the beginning, God has craved relationship with humans. So to bridge the gap between God and us, to be seen and known by us, the Word of God, the Logos, came to us in human form to be with us, to share in our lives. In John's third chapter, he says, So God loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. And no one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who has made him known. John says the reason Jesus, the Word, has shown up in human form is to make God known to us, so we can know what God is like, so we can know that God is real. But how do we know that God is real? John says it's because his word became flesh like us and lived among us, sharing our lives, our poverty, our fear, our uncertainty. The word he uses for flesh is sarks, meat, not something abstract, but the real stuff we're made of. John says Jesus is real, just like we are. That's okay for us Christians who've heard this all our lives, but how does the world know that God is real? Well, the same way we know it, from seeing God in each other. God tells us that since we can't see God who is a spirit, the purpose of Jesus' ministry, the work of Christ, is to make God known to us, to the world of humans. We've seen him through all those Christians down through history who have seen Christ in each other's lives, in kindness and sacrifice, in empathy and love. We've learned he's real, and it's up to us to share that understanding with the world. Jesus the Christ tells us to follow him, and he's very clear that we are to love each other as God loves us, to show up for each other. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus tells us what showing up means. In the parable of the sheep and goats, it's giving food and drink to the hungry and thirsty, befriending the stranger, clothing the naked, bringing healing to the sick, bringing company to every kind of captive. Because showing up means doing something. By seeing Christ, the Word, the light of the world reflected in us, The world out there sees that God is real, powerful, and active in our day-to-day world. When we follow Christ's way that he taught us, we reflect that light. (coughs) Excuse me. We reflect that light to the world. John is concerned with the battle between light and darkness because he himself has been a witness to that light that was coming into the world. So Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And he says, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in the darkness. Jesus is the light, and we are to shine in that light. When we reflect God's light, the light of the world, we push back the darkness, especially the darkness that we've seen so much of lately. In a few minutes, it will be our turn to show up. John's Gospel doesn't have a narrative of Jesus instituting the sacrament of communion. Instead, he tells his disciples about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, but he doesn't ask us to remember him the way the other Gospels do. During supper, he gets up, takes off his robe, wraps a towel around his waist, and washes the disciples' feet. He shows up for them in this very personal, intimate way and tells them to do the same, to show up for each other. He asks us to follow his way of love for each other, no matter who that other is. 
And he asks us to reflect him, to shine with his light in a world too, too full of darkness. He asks us to show the world who God really is by the way we live. God who is life and light and grace and truth. We've just finished Christmas celebrating God who shows up in the person of a little baby bringing hope of salvation to the world. And this morning we show up together to remember him in the very simple everyday act of eating and drinking. So as we remember the baby of Matthew and Luke, let's also remember the Logos of John, the powerful word who's responsible for everything, God's agent who makes God known to the world, the light who cannot be overcome by darkness. Let's pray. God of uncreated light, of creating word, thank you, thank you for giving us your son, the light of the world who became one of us to show us who you really are. Help us to keep that reality alive in our hearts as we enter a new year of anxiety and hope. Amen.